so that it, it gets recorded on the video as well. Okay. So please ro rotate this around when you. Oops. I will be handing out the turns. It's cold. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so we need that. We want to kick off the discussion. So we have about forty-five minutes at least, and it's now up to you, folks, to, to keep the speakers busy, to challenge their collective intellect. Take care. All right. Hello, um, the question is for Floyd. Uh, my name is Erion. Um, I wanted to know how do you come up with the ideas? Uh, so to say, is it a proverbial idea in the shower or do you have more concrete method, let's say more repeatable method to generate new ideas? Uh, oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, that's a very good question. Um, most ideas come from uh, our smart students, so I blame them. Um, we do, okay, there's a couple of techniques we do um, for the ideation process. Uh, one thing is if you design for the body, you have to move the body. Seems obvious, but a lot of, like we, do, we, we did a lot of um, uh, conversations with uh, game design companies who like, you know, develop, connect. Uh, Wii games, Sony Move games, and um, if you look in their um, studios, they design them exactly the same way as they design their previous games, mouse and keyboard games. Uh, either there's a whole bunch of developers sitting on their chairs in front of large screens, and they do that with their Kinect games, right? And so the first thing we tell them, you know, just get up, and you know, just have your meeting standing up, or move around, or have a you know a meeting outside, or just you know, move your body a little bit. Right? That's already helping a lot. And I think that helps for ideation process in general. Um, the next thing is um, we do like to, um, uh, this is where fail and fail often comes in, we do uh, like to get technology and then break it. Um, that you know, like you talked about uh, uh, funding challenges. Um, fund agencies don't really like to hear that, but we buy things and we break them and then we go back and say, oh look, it broke, um, we need another one. Um, because I think we can learn something from taking these things apart and um, uh, really trying to understand how we can see them from different perspectives. Um, one game um, which um, I didn't have time showing was um, a game where strangers, it's meant for strangers in public places and they have to hug each other and the more they awkwardly hug each other, the better, the ga the better they get in the game. And um, uh, that basic idea came around because we had a rebalance board. And you know, every rebalance board you see is you stand on it and then you ski, you um, cycle, you um, do some other balance thing. But then one of the students just picked it up and you know, pushed it against the other person's chest and said, you know, and just, again, it was about moving and moving with the technology and figured, ah, oh, there's just sensors that are now attached to the body. What can we do with that? So moving your body around is a great source for um, ideation. And we just do that in a collaborative environment and throw some technology in that we break at the same time. I think this is a very good question I mean, idea, where ideas do come from. So do other speakers want to expand on this from your personal perspective, Martin, at least? Oh, yes, sorry. Yeah. Oh, I, I would ask to, I would like to know how do you get rid of ideas? Because I think actually the problem is that, that we have many, 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 many more opportunities. I mean, looking at all your examples, Timbo, I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's, we've actually got much more to, to think about than we can actually then pursue. And I think one of the challenges that, that we find is that um, we don't have the time and resources actually to, to go after all these ideas. So I think, um, it's very much about managing the many ideas you get and, and making sure that you have a, a team of people, not just close, but also around you, that, that help you vet out what are actually the important ideas. Because, I mean, yeah, you, you can level up in academia and you can, you can do stuff that's fun and interesting, but it's really hard to see the ideas that are going to, to pay off in, in five or 10 or 20 years, I think. 
So, so that's, I think it's, it's important to have a very open conversation about what's actually important. And I think we had some really nice different examples here. Uh, I mean, Oscar challenging the whole you know, proposition of, oh, why look at mobility and, and energy when, when we want to you know, have a good life? Um, so motorcycling is okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, now can, can I wow. comment? Yeah. So now you have a double mic because we have two panel <laughs> audio systems here. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm very much influenced by uh, the French scholar Bruno Latour, who was he was giving the keynote at Kai last year. He um, he wrote the paper many years ago on on uh, on designers or actually research, technology, engineering, everything as associative work. Uh, where the power is, the power is creating the new thing is through association, and he had this like image of what it would be like an an old senior researcher sitting in his room with the files of of different research areas in his bookshelf. So there was this like one file with uh, neuroscience and all the papers of neuroscience there, and then maybe he had another. A uh, file on games, and then he had stacked all his research on games research in that file. So he had this, all these files with proper disciplinary research, and one day the bookshelf falls over, and then there's just this huge pile on the on the floor with with all these uh, research papers. And when he cleans it up, he brings up like one paper from here, and then one paper here. And when they see them side by side. He gets an idea. Ah, what if we combine these two? And then he said, "That's how um, that's how uh, news value is generated." And I'm really much inspired by that. And then you have to, when you think about that method, you have to, um, yeah, also have to think about what you put in your bookshelf before you kind of start doing the associative work. You have to think about what you stack in your bookshelf. And, and that's your question. I mean, it's like you can't stack whatever. You have to be some sort of value in, in the stuff that you have there. And that, it could be people, it could be papers, it could be uh, interior design of your, of your office spaces. It's lots of things you have to consider before you get the associative work going, like the students you recruit from all over the world and that, like you're, you're thinking about what you put together and then it's not so difficult, the associative work is not so difficult in itself, it kind of happens. Do you really want to take on this ideation sure. process? Two microphones. I'm not sure how much I can add. Um, I think all of us have different ways of trying to come up with things. Um, in many cases, of course, I'm working with PhD students who need to have ownership, or at least primary ownership, of ideas. And ideally, that means that they are the primary progenitor of those ideas. Um, but even so, I think it's easier to have ideas than it may be, unfortunately, in our real world to, to follow through on them. Because to follow through on ideas that are not just ideas that can be followed through on in a day or a week or maybe a month, but ones that take many months, it means we need to have the funding, we need to have the people who actually can follow through and be funded to follow through on them. And that often means that there are things that we'd love to do, but we can't because I'm limited by the amount of funding that I'm bringing in. Um, to a number of people who can't pursue all the cool things that we want to do. Um, and that can be frustrating sometimes because you know that you have something that would be really nice if you could only refine it, um, let alone even do it roughly to begin with, and yet there isn't, there's not enough person power to actually be able to go and do that. And that can become a, you know, somewhat frustrating. Um, I don't know what the real solution to that is. It'd be easy to say, well, as researchers, we should have as many folks as we want to and as many resources as we want to. Um, realistically, that's just not going to happen. Um, and so we all fight this problem of having to deal with a limited amount of time, a limited number of people, um, and if not an unlimited number of ideas, um, at least usually <laughs> a number of ideas that's greater than what we can actually follow through on. 
and know that there are some things that we'll follow through on that will probably not have been worth the effort of comparison with the ones that get away and trying as much as we hard, rather trying as much as we can to make sure that the ones that we do are the ones that are going to be the most fruitful. And yet knowing that if you pick the ones that absolutely look like they're really the right ones to do, you're going to miss some of the crazy ones that probably would have made more, more sense to do. Thank you. Can, can I add, sure. add one more? Oh, okay. <laughs> I just remembered something. Um, very, very briefly, because um, I want to plug the, um, uh, the work by Stephen Dow, if you're interested in having uh, more and better ideas. Uh, Stephen Dow, D-O-W, he did great work, he's at CMU, on the ideation process, and uh, he basically um, uh, confirmed what we um, in the lab do, which is one thing, if you have an idea, throw it away. Right? Your first idea is always shit, 98% of the time, but good enough to just always throw it out. That's number one. Number two is always have multiple ideas. Never sit down and go, okay, let's come up with one idea. Scrap that, say, let's come up with five ideas. And he showed that through this great example, you know, like these, um, these exercises you have to do, we have to drop an egg from like a three-story building and you have to build some kind of container or a parachute to get the egg onto the ground without breaking it. Um, he had this group of um, uh, students participating in that challenge. And for one group, he said, okay, you know, build one prototype and you've got one day or whatever it was, and then we see whether your egg breaks or not. And then you had this other group of students where you said, now build multiple prototypes. You still only have one day, right? So the time was the same. And let's see how well you do. And of course, it wasn't just only that the people who had multiple prototypes were more successful in getting the egg dropped without breaking it. It was also, he's got this really great video. It's like the, your mindset changes very, your mindset is a very different one if you have only prototype. Because, you know, here in multiple prototype, people said, ah, oh, yeah, you know, we tried this, and then we had this other idea, and then we refined, and then we iterated, and then we threw out this idea and concentrated more on this. So they were very, like, multi-perspective and more communicative with each other. And then you had these other people who had only one prototype, and they were sitting down and going, uh, we did this because this is clearly the best way to approach this problem. Right, so they don't even saw that there might be other options or anything. So as soon as you sit down and go, ah, I want to have one idea, your mind shuts down and is really like focused on this one thing. If you start off with having multiple, wanting to have multiple ideas, you will have multiple ideas. And his research showed that they actually will be better. All right, thank you. Next question, buddy. Remember, there will be a limited number of chances to ask a question. <laughs> Well, in Kroma, or University of Applied Sciences. My question is mostly to Martin, but I would like to hear opinions of all panelists, if you let me. So my background is uh, home services, platforms, solutions, etc., ambient assisted living and something. Uh, I see the following picture. We have different group of researchers working in, on different, in different domains, like smart homes, smart cities, there are smart hospitals, smart uh, institutions or educational organizations, etc. So very smart like you presented, but I don't see so much of conversions. So these domains are somehow separated, and uh, there are some discussions about smart living, which would probably join all these domains. But uh, evidence show that there is not much of such uh, domains are still pretty much discrete. How would you please comment on that, and what do you think has to be done to eliminate this problem? Thank you. It's a very good question, and it's very easy to answer. <clears throat> because all of these verticals that have discrete um, business models or service models, they don't want to change. Because they're, these models have been institutionalized and they work, and the alternatives don't work. A very good parallel is journalism, media. It doesn't work and nobody knows what to do and it certainly doesn't pay off to change, so they don't. But the easy answer is that this is the convergence. The, the technology that we all carry in our pockets and is now being deployed is forcing all these uh, different uh, layers to converge. Either they can try to operate together or they can go out of business. 
The only thing that can stall that is by these um, monopolies to fight it. And, and that could be done politically or it could be done uh, commercially, but that's, that's the only thing that, that basically can fight. That's, that's the total overall system we see. And the problem is not that we don't know how these wonderful connected living facilities should look like. That's pretty easy. We have studies from like the last 50 years to do so on how they shouldn't look coming back to Tati. But nobody can provide them. So we know the demand, we know the needs, but we don't have the suppliers. Because these partnerships that are supposed to supply it, they don't exist yet. They have not been created. They're coming. But this is the driving force in, in connecting the world. So connecting people. Huh. <coughs> Considering that Nokia has a and it's just, just a small extra comment. There was a slide I didn't show, and that was a ranking of uh, European non capitals, non capital cities, with the highest smart city potential. And in the top six, or top seven, three were Danish, and three were, were Finnish, including Olo. Tampere and, and some more, Turku, I think. And what they scored really high on were governance. And, and that means that, that the, the, the framework around the technology was quite well developed and funded. Um, so that's only one side of the coin because there's business to it, even though we're in Scandinavia. Um, but actually, that's, that's one of the, the things that, that need to happen is that the political level and the governance level understands what we're doing and understands why these ideas, why we think they're important. So coming back to the question before, I think the whole you know, understanding of what the fuck's going on is, is the real uh, challenge because the businesses, they'll, they'll just stall and not just businesses but also institutions. They will fight this. Yeah. So uh, a comment about the, the pointing to the smartphone. It's very easy to think uh, the year being 2014, oh, it's the smartphone, right? This is the pinnacle of everything that we're going after. Now, I do ask people 10 years before, they wouldn't have said that. 10 years before that, they wouldn't have said that. Each generation would have picked some particular thing. Oh, it's the laptop, right? Oh, it's the personal computer that actually can sit on my desk. Oh, it's the personal computer that sits next to my desk. Oh, it's the computer that only takes up a small room in size, right? Um, smartphones are here now. They won't necessarily be here in 10 years. Um, and so one thing to think about is there are a number of technologies that make it possible to make very tiny things, much tinier than a phone, that might not have as much smarts, at least right now, as a phone, that don't really serve as a phone or serve as the multifaceted thing that these things we call phones are um, that are going to start appearing, have already started appearing. The smart watch, for example, smart jewelry of various sorts, little tiny devices that can be very tiny and low powered because they're using certain kinds of low power radios that weren't around a couple of years ago. And so I think we're going to see a, a, a multiplicity of different kinds of devices that I guess we'll call smart this is that sort of smart other things um, that may supplant that single smartphone as the carrier of all of our aspirations. I'd like to come back to that. I, I just want to return a question. What, what was uh, the problem? You had multiple areas working on various, I mean, it's like. They pretty much separated the script and how to make them all working together. What is needed for that? Yeah, but why do you want them to work together? is a small cell of the ubiquitous city, for example. And the hospital is another cell which is a bit larger. Okay. So to me, they all are belonging to one ecosystem. Okay. And I don't okay. see that discrete. Okay. And I don't think we share the vision of, of city life and urban life. I don't think of the city as one organism where like one particular part is a cell into I think that is uh, uh, it's a particular view on what city life and the urban 
life is and I think it's like we will see a multitude of activities, people using the concept of city and things for various purposes. That's, that's what is a city, what the city is. So I, I can't see a problem with that in principle. I hope it will never be joined. Martin, do you want to put a point to you? First, I want to, to second that, but it doesn't necessarily ring that way to me. It, I, I think there's some barriers to actually providing a nice experience for certain people. It doesn't have to be the same experience or everyone is one big hive mind. But it, there, there are some barriers to actually doing what you want to do to, if you want to provide a service. That's how I, I hear it. It doesn't have to be the, the, the total hive mind. That's the logical extension. I don't know if I hear correctly, but that's how I answered. Okay, so coming back to the mobile, because that's interesting. I, I think, uh, yeah, every, every time has its, its uh, sort of uh, focus and, and, and thing. Uh, it would be really interesting to share some numbers on how big the change has been around the mobile and the reasons for that specific uh, manifestation of technology, um, why that has become so. Um, and also, I don't think that it's just the mobile, but it's, it's as sort of the, uh, your, your string into the digital with all this smartness lying around. But it would be interesting to see some, some very hard figures uh, on that, comparing to other technologies. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Next question was there, and then there. Thank you, Mohamed and Dan from the University of Bath. And uh, I have a question to uh, Professor Fader. Um, all the examples you gave of augmented reality were all uh, visual overlays. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very heavy, heavy bias in terms of visual augmented reality. I'm particularly interested myself in uh, aerial uh, augmented reality. So I guess could you give any examples of um, work? I'm not sure if, if you do work in the, in the area of uh, well, tactile or uh, auditory augmented reality. And then uh, what struck me was the you of Google Glass, that kind of scares me because uh, Google Glass seems like it will kind of uh, force a lot of researchers into focusing more heavily on visual augmented reality and maybe the other areas might go with sale. So I guess that's my question to you and the question to the group is uh, could you give any advice to dangers of maybe focusing research on a particular type of technology and how that may um, Okay, so it's a whole bunch of questions and points. Um, when I defined augmented reality at the beginning, I tried to be very careful, if you looked at the words that I used, not to bias towards the visual. And there has been a history in user interface design of talking about visual things. Um, GUIs, for example, graphical user interfaces. Um, so I tried to be very careful about saying that it was about um, uh, doing things that uh, integrated with your experience of the real world rather than with what you saw of the real world. Now, it's true, most of what I showed was predominantly visual. Some of the things that I showed actually have auditory components. Um, there are other things that, that my lab has done, uh, although most not within the urban AR domain that have addressed uh, auditory uh, interaction. Um, because of the technologies needed, um, my, my lab doesn't actually do any work with active haptics, for example, that is to say haptic devices that really, you know, themselves can push back and move as opposed to ones that um, are passively haptic. And so while there are folks who do that kind of work, my lab does not. We do do work with, with auditory stuff, um, some of which have been in the sort of games and entertainment environment. Um, some of which, however, have been in the urban environment. I'm realizing that while I showed one slide that for the sake of, of being one that I talked over but which was silent itself, concentrated on visual stuff um, in the work that included that um, image of one of the older uh, Columbia, or rather one of the, the now long since gone uh, buildings that used to be where Columbia currently is. 
Um, that was part of an experience that had um, a voiceover, um, a narration, uh, and other kinds of sound components. Um, so I think that a full multimodal experience, or at least the ability to have a full multimodal experience, is extremely important. With regard to glass, um, glass is, I think, responsible for a lot of the uh, fact that many people who before glass was announced in 2012 um, did not know or never heard the, the phrase augmented reality, suddenly we're talking about it because a lot of, of folks in the press, when Glass was announced, uh, had, had heard the phrase augmented reality and not being researchers themselves, applied it to anything that involved some kind of a see-through display that you wore. Um, and that's really not in the definition I was using what we, it's researchers normally consider to be AR. Um, and so it's sort of a blessing and a curse. It was a, it was a wonderful way to suddenly be able to talk to people who are asking questions about and, and had heard the phrase before. And yet at the same time, it was frustrating because while one can do um, what researchers in AR consider to be AR with glass, um, the unit will die in around 15 to 20 minutes if you actually try to do that. And it'll be a very unsatisfactory experience because it's monocular, one eye, and not directly in your line of sight. Um, all that said, um, again, it's been great for getting people to be aware of the phrase. Uh, but I think most people I know who do research in AR do not see glass, Google Glass it is, as being an example of of AR, at least the way in which you're encouraged to use it by both the developers at Google and by just the raw facts of the hardware and software. Um, so there is a danger, obviously, when a phrase kind of gets away from you. And for a long time before the popularization of that phrase, courtesy in part due to glass, researchers had their way. They were able to say, AR, and if someone else said AR and meant something else by it, you could always say, well, I'm the researcher and I know, and you know, most of the people who used that phrase were the researchers and they knew and they agreed. And suddenly when something gets away from you, it's a little scary. I remember back when I was a graduate student, my former advisor was then doing in part work on what was called then distributed processing. And the folks who in research suddenly were discovering that folks in industry were using that term in a way that the researchers thought was indiscriminate and wrong, it's, except it turns out there were only so many researchers and there were orders of magnitude more folks in industry, and guess who won? Um, so I think already we're at the point at which AR to many people means something very different than you know, my attempt to try to hold down the fort of keeping it in the pure way in which People in research have been using it for a long time. <laughs> and it's clear as more and more people use the phrase, it's going to mean things that folks in research don't want it to mean. And guess what? We're just going to have to get used to it, <laughs> even though we might try to protest. Any other comments on this? Just, just a quick comment to your other question. <clears throat> so are there any dangers of focusing on one specific technology? Well. First of all, I think there's a danger in focusing on technology. Um, so I would just very quickly, what, what we usually say is that there are three perspectives that are, well, there are many, but, but three operational perspectives uh, on, on these situations. And one is technology, yeah, and you can focus on that and become good and all that. But there are, there are other ones, and the two others I want to mention is, um, you can see it as materials. So there's no real difference between uh, physical materials and those physical materials that have digital qualities. Look at it as material, you know, competence that you you gain in a conversation around, and then as a medium, as a medium for communication, and that goes actually on any scale. So it could could be the very small scales so or the what you work with or the complex systems, and whether you look at them as technologies or materials as me or as media gives you a different conversation. So I think that's helpful, not just to have a technology perspective. All right, thank you. Are you happy? Thank you. I can also um, quickly say something about um, 
So if you really want to put the body into the center of the experience, um, any kind of experience, um, I can't really say much, uh, too much about audio, but definitely about the haptic um, component. Uh, I definitely, mean, this is up to you now, the, um, the, the generations of researchers coming up to do more exciting haptic work. And um, what I, like this is my personal thing, right? So if you want to do haptic, don't do, um, you know, take the mobile phone apart and put in, you know, your little um, um, accentuator there and say this is haptic. I mean, I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't want to see that anymore. I'm bored with it. Um, uh, and don't, don't tell, also tell us that, um, yeah, ah, if we would have only $10,000, we could buy a proper force feedback device and then it would be all awesome. And then we've got another haptic um, phantom demo that I've also seen to death. Um, so do some Something exciting with haptics. Um, best example, again, I want to refer to other researchers. Uh, Patrick Bowdish did this awesome game at Kai where he couldn't afford a big haptic thing. So he did a game where it was crowdsourcing, basically, he crowdsourced haptics. So it wasn't a computer doing the haptics, he got other people play a game by doing haptics to the person who was the user. So you got more points by the more haptic you replied to that person. And I thought that was a really cool idea of, you know, like seeing, you know, it was, there wasn't, the technology wasn't material. It was a different thinking about how we can stimulate these senses. So, yeah, look up that, uh, that demo by Patrick Bowdish. It looks hilarious, the video, when they right. push the other person. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lady on the left. Okay, my name is Raya Arne, and I'm from the Department of English and Science here in the local University. Anyway, my main interest is in, in, in e-inclusion, and that so far I kind of think that, that e-inclusion means that, that everything, everybody are included. So what do you think the future of this ubiquitous thinking that uh, current, we have a lot of elderly people around of us, we have disabled, we have, I mean, of technology, um, why that has become so. Um, and also, I don't think that it's just the mobile, but it's, it's as sort of the, uh, your, your string into the digital with all this smartness lying around. But it would be interesting to see some, some very hard figures uh, on that, comparing to other technologies. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Next question was there, and then there. Yeah, thank you, Mohamed and uh, Dan from the University of Bath. And uh, I have a question to uh, Professor Fader. Um, all the examples you gave of augmented reality were all uh, visual overlays. Mm -hmm. So that's a very, very heavy, heavy bias in terms of visual augmented reality. I'm particularly interested myself in uh, aerial uh, augmented reality. So I guess could you give any examples of um, work? I'm not sure if, if you do work in the, in the area of uh, well, tactile or uh, auditory augmented reality. And then uh, what struck me was the you of blue glass, that kind of scares me because uh, blue glass seems like it will kind of uh, force a lot of researchers into focusing more heavily on visual augmented reality and maybe the other areas might go with sale. So I guess that's my question to you and the question to the group is uh, could you give any advice to the dangers of maybe focusing research on a particular type of technology and how that may um, Okay, so it's a whole bunch of questions and points. Um, when I defined augmented reality at the beginning, I tried to be very careful, if you looked at the words that I used, not to bias towards the visual. And there has been a history in user interface design of talking about visual things. Um, GUIs, for example, graphical user interfaces. Um, so I tried to be very careful about saying that it was about um, uh, doing things that uh, integrated with your experience of the real world rather than with what you saw of the real world. Now, it's true, most of what I showed was predominantly visual. Some of the things that I showed actually have auditory components. Um, there are other things that, that my lab has done, uh, although most not within the urban AR domain that have addressed uh, auditory uh, interaction. Um, because of the technologies needed, um, my, my lab doesn't actually do any work with active haptics, for example, that is to say haptic devices that really, you know, themselves can push back and move as opposed to ones that um, are passively haptic. 
And so while there are folks who do that kind of work, my lab does not. We do do work with, with auditory stuff, um, some of which have been in the sort of games and entertainment environment. Um, some of which, however, have been in the urban environment. I'm realizing that while I showed one slide that for the sake of, of being one that I talked over but which was silent itself, concentrated on visual stuff um, in the work that included that um, image of one of the older uh, Columbia, or rather one of the, the now long since gone uh, buildings that used to be where Columbia currently is. Um, that was part of an experience that had um, a voiceover, um, a narration, uh, and other kinds of sound components. Um, so I think that a full multimodal experience, or at least the ability to have a full multimodal experience, is extremely important. With regard to glass, um, glass is, I think, responsible for a lot of the uh, fact that many people who before glass was announced in 2012 um, did not know or never heard the, the phrase augmented reality, suddenly we're talking about it because a lot of, of folks in the press, when Glass was announced, uh, had, had heard the phrase augmented reality and not being researchers themselves, applied it to anything that involved some kind of a see-through display that you wore. Um, and that's really not in the definition I was using what we, it's researchers normally consider to be AR. Um, and so it's sort of a blessing and a curse. It was a, it was a wonderful way to suddenly be able to talk to people who are asking questions about and, and had heard the phrase before. And yet at the same time, it was frustrating because while one can do um, what researchers in AR consider to be AR with glass, um, the unit will die in around 15 to 20 minutes if you actually try to do that. And it'll be a very unsatisfactory experience because it's monocular, one eye, and not directly in your line of sight. Um, all that said, um, again, it's been great for getting people to be aware of the phrase. Uh, but I think most people I know who do research in AR do not see glass, Google Glass it is, as being an example of of AR, at least the way in which you're encouraged to use it by both the developers at Google and by just the raw facts of the hardware and software. Um, so there is a danger, obviously, when a phrase kind of gets away from you. And for a long time before the popularization of that phrase, courtesy in part due to glass, researchers had their way. They were able to say, AR, and if someone else said AR and meant something else by it, you could always say, well, I'm the researcher and I know, and you know, most of the people who used that phrase were the researchers and they knew and they agreed. And suddenly when something gets away from you, it's a little scary. I remember back when I was a graduate student, my former advisor was then doing in part work on what was called then distributed processing. And the folks who in research suddenly were discovering that folks in industry were using that term in a way that the researchers thought was indiscriminate and wrong, it's, except it turns out there were only so many researchers and there were orders of magnitude more folks in industry, and guess who won? Um, so I think already we're at the point at which AR to many people means something very different than you know, my attempt to try to hold down the fort of keeping it in the pure way in which People in research have been using it for a long time. <laughs> and it's clear as more and more people use the phrase, it's going to mean things that folks in research don't want it to mean. And guess what? We're just going to have to get used to it, <laughs> even though we might try to protest. Any, more, any other comments on this? Just, just a quick comment to your other question. <clears throat> so are there any dangers of focusing on one specific technology? Well. First of all, I think there's a danger in focusing on technology. Um, so I would just very quickly, what, what we usually say is that there are three perspectives that are, well, there are many, but, but three operational perspectives uh, on, on these situations. And one is technology, yeah, and you can focus on that and become good and all that. But there are, there are other ones, and the two others I want to mention is, um, you can see it as materials, 
so there's no real difference between uh, physical materials and those physical materials that have digital qualities. Look at it as material, you know, competence that you you gain in a conversation around, and then as a medium, as a medium for communication, and that goes actually on any scale. So it could could be the very small scale, so the what you work with or the complex systems, and whether you look at them as technologies or materials as me or as media gives you a different conversation. So I think that's helpful, not just to have a technology perspective. All right, thank you. Are you happy? Thank you. I can also um, quickly say something about, um, so if you really want to put the body into the center of the experience, um, any kind of experience, um, I can't really say much, uh, too much about audio, but definitely about the haptic um, component. Uh, I definitely, I mean, this is up to you now, the, um, the, the generations of researchers coming up to do more exciting haptic work. And um, what I, like this is my personal thing, right? So if you want to do haptic, don't do, um, you know, take the mobile phone apart and put in, you know, your little um, um, accentuator there and say this is haptic. I mean, I'm just, yeah, I don't, I don't want to see that anymore. I'm bored with it. Um, uh, and don't, don't tell, also tell us that, um, yeah, ah, if we would have only $10,000, we could buy a proper force feedback device and then it would be all awesome. And then we've got another haptic um, phantom demo that I've also seen to death. Um, so do some Something exciting with haptics. Um, best example, again, I want to refer to other researchers. Uh, Patrick Bowdish did this awesome game at Kai where he couldn't afford a big haptic thing. So he did a game where it was crowdsourcing, basically, he crowdsourced haptics. So it wasn't a computer doing the haptics, he got other people play a game by doing haptics to the person who was the user. So you got more points by the more haptic you reply to that person. And I thought that was a really cool idea of, you know, like seeing, you know, it was, there wasn't, the technology wasn't material. It was a different thinking about how we can stimulate these senses. So, yeah, look up that, uh, that demo by Patrick Bowdish. It looks hilarious, the video, when they push the other person. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lady on the left. Okay, my name is Raya Aron, and I'm from the Department of Human Services and Science here in the Royal University. Anyway, my main interest is in, in, in e-inclusion, and that so far I kind of think that, that e-inclusion means that, that everything, everybody are included. So what do you think the future of this ubiquitous thinking that uh, current, we have a lot of elderly people around of us, we have disabled, we have, I mean, disabled. So somebody already mentioned with this haptics, well, that, that's good, but, um, what about, because we know that, that the society is getting older and older, and we are getting older, as you know. So what do you think the future? How long does it take that all of us are included in this ubiquitous world? I think this falls on Martin's lap first. Well, um, I think it has much to do with what you, we just talked about, not forcing everyone to use the same system and then see if we can get that to 100% usage. What's happening in Denmark now is that everyone is being force-fed digitalization. So your social identity number, digital, boom, you have to use it. Then what happens is that you can opt out and people do that. But in fact, there's, an, there's a very substantial uh, group of people that are getting help. So now we are seeing a demand for support systems to support helpers of other people getting online. So, so that's sort of a, a shortcut. So people, elderly people with, with children, their children helps them. So now we see a, a big demand for, for systems that support people who support other people. And I think that's, that's a much more fruitful way of, of seeing this, maybe coming back to, to your point about why should everything converge. Well, it isn't. And if we're trying to think of it as the Danish government is, and, and still are up to this point, seeing these systems as, as like one-off, one interface for everyone, then it'll, it's becoming really problematic. So what, what I think we're seeing is a demand for, for differentiated approaches and some are not at all digital and they very much rely on, on the interaction, the, the social structure that, that are around the people who need help of some sort. So, so I'd say, uh, well, don't try to build something for everyone. Okay. 
Thank you. So, yeah, so it's again, I, I struggle with the question. You say it's like everyone has to be included, and then you talk about the elderly. And then I drop the microphone. Oh, you're okay. You got both. Okay, they, they're both here. Okay, good. So I, I, I just struggle with the question. It's like, um, that's one thing I can't really understand. Why should everybody want to be included? And, it's, and when I think about the, the type of things that where everybody would should be included, that's like uh, education for kids, then all are required, and if they don't go to school, the police will get come and get them. Like you do the military service, all those sort of stuff that's like, they're really based on harsh requirement for all to take part. Tax. Tax, yeah. So it's like all that stuff. Why should... I mean, it's like I need more motivation before I like accept that question. But then, if you say it's like, oh, this is this person who can't, who struggle with doing this in their life, or just like going to toilet or whatever it is, if it's an old one, then of course we can start to talk about how we can use technology. And uh, but then I have then I have an issue with. Uh, like we've seen in, in Sweden, we've seen like the smart home research when the people are get government funding for do, doing research on ubiquitous computing. And then if you have a public problem like the elderly, you're more, you're more, uh, then you're, it's easy to get research money. And then you build up this smart home. And then was the, this home for people who had brain damages. Uh, and, and they built this home. And of course it was this tati. But it wasn't so funny because the people who are like mentally handicapped, so it was like for them it was a living hell to live in that apartment that didn't, of course, didn't work. So it's like for me, it's like this is fundamentally wrong. They're fundamentally problematic. Uh, both to think of it as like everybody should do it, and then having state funding to start with these people bef before everything is like when our stuff in this like prototype stage and nothing works. So maybe then we should do like other games. <laughs> All right, thank you. Gentlemen number 33 there in the middle. I think games yeah, so it's, my it's, it's, a lot of people are turning uh, today we have a had uh, very nice uh, descriptions of various types of uh, technologies, but not, not only technologies, but uh, <coughs> for example, Martin was uh, saying that it's not about technologies, uh, it's about cultural transformation and organization building, and Oscar was talking about this uh, consumer cultures or, or fashion. Uh, and, and my question is, is about getting published about phenomena that touches several dis disciplines and the being involved with interdisciplinary phenomena, interdisciplinary research. So what's your idea about this? Uh, is it uh, that you have uh, groups where different people have different set of skills and come from different kinds of backgrounds or are you con can consider yourselves as uh, interdisciplinary research persons or what, what's your take on interdisciplinarity and publishing? Uh, I, I, yes. <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, I mean, that's why I brought up the, um, my, my first slide about my background, because um, I, yes, I do consider myself uh, multidisciplinary, and I'm proud of it. Um, I do also acknowledge that it's probably true what my very first dean told me. So when I started university, my dean was a uh, first week, um, like it was, it was a multimedia degree, it was called back then. And um, our dean came in and uh, greeted all of our new students. And he said, because you are multimedia, and we were the first um, graduates that are going to come out of this, out of a university, which was very traditional. You know, you either do computer science, you do cultural studies, or you do design. So now there are all these people who want to do this multidisciplinary stuff. And then our dean told us, first week, I remember that, um, he said, so you're all going to know a little bit about um, everything, but nothing really right. 
And that kind of set us up for the, you know, that's, we were all known in the rest of the university. Ah, these are the guys who don't know a little bit about everything, but nothing really right. And we got to know that, you know, the entire, um, uh, the entire program. So that's, that's what you have to live with. But I think it's more important that the students who work in the lab um, can talk to other people to figure out the details about small little bits that are highly specialized. So it's about communicating with other people that multidisciplinary people I think are really good at. Being able to understand and talk to somebody who studied computer science while switching over in a meeting to talk to somebody who did cultural studies, who then, then talking to an architect. And I think that's the multidisciplinary team, multidisciplinarity that we really appreciate. Oscar and then I think we're very fortunate to work in this area because it is a truly interdisciplinary um, community. I mean, you, the stuff you can get published in, in, in the areas of HCI, you, this, we've seen the this papers here, and CCW. It's like, it's amazing how broad, how broad the acceptance is and how open the community is for trying out new things. It's like, it's like the HCI, it's like it doesn't have a core. It's just, it's just a rhizome that kind of goes everywhere. So it's like, I don't see, I don't see this as, as a particular challenge. I, I, I just see a broad acceptance to, uh, to various directions and new combinations. And I think if you, if you go to the CHI conference, it's like you see new types of uh, methods and ways of writing and stuff like that happening all the time. I think we're exceptionally fortunate in this area. Uh, in the work that my students and I do, I guess we, we tend less to think of ourselves as being uh, interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary and more in terms of, of interdisciplinarity and multidisciplinarity having to do with us working with folks who are in different disciplines. And so we've had the privilege of working with people who are botanists and civil engineers and architects and anesthesiologists and journalists and basically people in a variety of different disciplines enabling us to be able to publish in places that normally we would never be able to uh, feel comfortable actually submitting uh, papers to. Um, and it's just very exciting to be working with people who have a great deep expertise in things that I have only the most outsider view of, and then sometimes learning little bits and pieces of their field so I can actually have some knowledge about a little teeny tiny fraction of it. Um, but more important than that, actually being able to work with someone who really does know that really deeply. So when we get together, we can do things that contribute both from the sort of computer science perspective and also from the perspective of somebody else's discipline. And that's just amazing fun to work with bright people who know things that, that you know, I can only look at from the standpoint of an outsider. Yeah, I actually think there is an issue but I also think that there are venues where you can, can do this, but it depends on your institution. Uh, the book that I mentioned that's coming out like this week, maybe today, uh, <laughs> looks at interaction, this urban interaction design as a field coming together of many fields. So you might want to look at our take on how that's happening and how the field is responding to this, including the institutions, universities and so on. Thank you. Before the next question, Paula, can you check if it's training? or not outside. The reason I'm asking how to do this is that if it's not raining, we will have a group photo after this session. If it's raining a lot, we will not have it. <laughs> we'll have it inside. <laughs> not or is or not? No. Okay. 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 Gentlemen there. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to read my question. I don't want to forget any bits. Um, in your presentation, I'm talking to you, Martin. Um, open data sources seems to provide agency to citizens when it comes to control the role, the role of organizations such as government departments. But if you look from the other way around, if we consider that opening data sets can be also a virtual process, topics like citizens' privacy start to be a little bit complicated. 
Uh, my question is about the ethical debate that is behind, sometimes it's also after, the opening of those uh, information sources. So can you tell us about your own experience, um, how the boundaries of that informational opening have been set? And I don't know if, it, if in your case it was a participatory process or, or, or you just, I don't know how it happened. So could you just tell us, you know, brief, briefly how, how that happened in your case? Yes, um, thanks for that question. I think it's it's really a big problem to figure out how we handle all this data. Because on the one side, it's it's there's a lot of value in it. I'll come back to that. But on the other side, there's this big rich risk, uh, the NSA, Snowden, and all that. Shown us, Facebook. Mm. Um, but in this particular case, I think, like I said, all the organizations, so the, the process has been very open, and there's been very open group, work group around this, trying to figure out, so how can we do this? How can we do it in a non-silo way, in a distributed way, both technically and organizationally, with licenses and all, all, all that. Um, so that's been very a very open process. I don't think many um, citizens, if that's a category, um, cared. They just want stuff to work and not be harmful. Um, basically, like you know, roads and stuff. Um, but I see this now coming into the conversation. So a bit like Google Glasses have brought some specific technologies into the public realm, the conversation. I, I see the same thing happening now with, with Snowden and, and there's been in Denmark a very big scandal, a bit, bit like the, the ones that the UK had of uh, you know, phone tapping and people actually following the credit card transactions of famous people. So now that famous people were, you know, sort of hit, whoa, suddenly it was a problem. <clears throat> but, but, but to be honest, I don't think that we have found the good ways of, of handling this um, authority, you could say, or, or this condition. Uh, and I really think that, that the solution is very much like everything else here, that we have to take baby steps. And they, they must be iterative processes so that when it, it blows up in our faces, it doesn't sort of blow us all away. So I think that's, that's probably the way to go about it. So we don't just, you know, leave it to some government agency or some, you know, one big bang process to implement a good solution. It's, it's really like everything else, that it has to be, you know, meddled uh, together. Very boring answer, but, but I think so. <laughs> it's too dangerous the other way. Do you want to comment on that? And, oh, and by the way, the, the value of open data. Everybody thinks like open data is like gold or a, a new lot of raw material. No, it's not. It's a big expense. It's, it's like environmental plans. They cost a lot of money to implement and, and nobody knows what we're going to gain, but we're pretty sure we will, as a society, society gain something. But, but there's no, so, so an incremental investment in open data is not getting the same incremental value in return. So, so I think the whole mindset about why open data, well, we have to, like, we have to keep the air clean and, and that kind of investment. I think the whole thinking about open data is, is screwed up. All right, thank you, Martin. Okay, time flies. I'm afraid we have to conclude here, so let's give a big hand to our panel.